I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join us on a quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small, encounters that move us beyond words. Your host for this episode is Tenery Taylor. Stephen Melendez is the artistic director of the New York Theatre Ballet. He starred in ballets on stages all over the world, winning principal roles in The Nutcracker, Giselle, Peter Pan, Sleeping Beauty. The press that followed his career always homed in on his childhood. I really hated that I was known as the homeless dancer or the dancer who was discovered at a young age in a New York City shelter. I'm not over-exaggerating this. You can Google my name and the reviews of my performances, and almost every single one of them at some point in the article mentions something about my background. And it was really difficult for me because I wanted to be judged on what I was doing. You know, was I a good dancer or not? Stephen Melendez wanted to talk about where he was going, starring on stages in South America, Europe, and the U.S., not about where he came from. But a little over a decade ago, his attitude started to change as he became the subject of a documentary film project, one in which the director, David Peterson, would push him to revisit the shelter where he once lived and to think about the pain that was long buried. This wasn't to simply capitalize on the storyline of Stephen's trajectory from homeless shelter to world stage— No, it was to shine a light on the program that took him to those heights and is still helping disadvantaged children today, kids experiencing homelessness or insecure housing who gain access to the world of classical ballet. After more than a decade of filming, the documentary Lift is out in theaters and on streaming platforms. One recent afternoon, I got online with both Stephen Melendez and David Peterson because we want to share with you the wonder of the film's stories, and in particular, the wonder in the change of heart that Stephen has had as an adult, as a seasoned, world-class dancer. Today, he will wholeheartedly tell you where he got his start in ballet. When he was seven, Stephen Melendez lived with his younger sister and their single mother, Myra Romero. We were living in a really beautiful single-family home on Rosedale Avenue in the Bronx. Kind of a nice part of the Bronx, uh, middle-income families. And the landlord uh, died, the guy who owned the building, died um, unexpectedly from, I think it was a heart attack or a stroke. And the person who took over the property evicted us. And it happened so suddenly that uh, we didn't have the opportunity to grab any of our things. So not only were we out on the street, but we were out on the street without any stuff. We ended up in the homeless shelter. Did you ever get your stuff back? No. No, we didn't. Um, And, you know, it's interesting. My mother at that time worked at Mount Sinai Hospital. She was a medical researcher. She left the shelter every day in a white lab coat to go to work. It really breaks people's brains, I think, a little bit to hear that it's possible to end up in the situation we ended up in without being the stereotype that they expect it to be. My mother was not a drug addict or a prostitute or mentally ill or anything like that. Um, She was a very normal, single, working mother with a pretty respectable job and an education. And the reality of New York City just caught up, you know, all the things landed at at the wrong time. Um, You know, if you think about the mechanics of it, what does it cost to move, actually, if you had to pick up and move today? You'd need first and last month deposit. You'd need to pay the broker fee. And if you're moving, as we did, literally overnight, in the interim, you'd need to be able to pay for a hotel room or a week of hotel rooms, at least, until you found something. And if you have a child or two children, like she did, you can't do with a studio. My family is kind of spread out, and we're not very close with others, and she didn't have a support system. I was a kid. I don't really know. But I don't know that there was anything she could have done differently to not end up where we ended up. 
I asked Stephen how he processed such an unexpected change of circumstances and at such a young age. This will sound silly until you actually are in it and then you realize how all of these little things add up. Where I grew up was a quiet residential street. There were private homes with front yards and backyards. And the shelter, it was right under a highway, you know, just a block away from a major interstate in New York City. It had constant, constant fire trucks and ambulances and police. In fact, we were right across the street from a firehouse. So literally constantly sirens going. The air quality, because we were in the industrial area of the Bronx, you know, quite literally there were burnt out cars on the street corners and auto repair shops down the way. And the, the heavy metals recycling factory was a block down the hill. The garbage depot was, you know, a couple blocks away. It was the part of New York City where nobody else wanted to live because it really wasn't the place worth living. And all of that was what happened outside the shelter. Inside, actually, honestly, it wasn't so bad. Or maybe my mother was really good at keeping me in the right place at the right time. You know, inside, it was fairly clean. Well, it was maybe overly cleaned. It had that, you know, bleach kind of institutional chemical smell. But... Not one that is offensive. The people were nice. The security guards, which, I mean, every single day to go through barbed wire in and out to get home. And you start wondering whether they're keeping us in or keeping everybody else out. And then you'd wonder who wants to break into a homeless shelter. It sort of sets the temperature for the day, you know, when you have to check in and out past a security desk, a double buzzing gate. But the people were nice. The, the people that worked there were very nice. They were empathetic. Um, so it's an interesting, strange juxtaposition of things that are only impactful when taken in their totality. If you'd come, as I did, from a very, very, very different experience only days before, the shock of the change is actually more impactful than the shock of the space itself. One day, a woman named Diana Beyer got buzzed in right past the barbed wire of the shelter. Beyer, as it happened, oversaw the New York Theater Ballet's outreach program called LIFT, which invites children living in shelters to come learn ballet. Myra Romero, Stephen's mother, signed him up for ballet classes. And I explicitly did not want to take them, but my mother forced me to do it because uh, she didn't have daycare for me. And I couldn't be in the shelter alone while my mom was at work. Stephen, were you familiar at all with ballet? No, (laughs) not at all. I was a very typical Puerto Rican boy in the Bronx. I was in Little League. I played baseball. I had a crush on the girl next door. No, nothing about my life had anything to do with the arts or dance. But Stephen was a natural At the end of the short workshop, I was offered a scholarship to stay in the school through Lyft. And I didn't want to do that either, but my mother made me do that. And a year later, I was on stage for the first time in The Nutcracker, as most young dancers are. And I played the role of Little Mouse Number 2. And at the end of the show, I went out on stage and I got to take a bow. And it was, it was a life-changing moment for me to be in front of 300, 400 people um, and having them clap. And I thought that the applause was for me, of course. It felt amazing. In fact, I'm sure the applause was for the professional dancers behind me who had just done a full performance, not my little tiny part. But it, it was a really special moment for me to feel the praise and adulation of others. Um, and it was something that, I mean, any child needs that. But... It was something that, from my background, I was maybe especially lacking. Before we follow Stephen on to what would become an international career in ballet, it's important to understand what made the LIFT program different from other outreach programs. Over 30 years ago, Diana Beyer, who is the founder of New York Theatre Ballet and was the founder of the LIFT program, uh, participated in a New York City program that asked arts organizations to work with homeless shelters and to figure out some way to have their programs for or of or about the populations in those shelters. 
Uh, that program originally was funded by the city for workshops, for discrete one-week or two-week engagements. And it was only funded for a couple of years. And Diana had some kind of vision for the future. She recognized that the program was incredible, that it was important to make dance and arts accessible for everyone. Uh, but she also recognized that the program was flawed. It was flawed because... The children were exposed to this really incredible thing that inevitably they fell in love with. And then after the workshop was finished, it was taken away from them. And not only was it taken away from them, but there was, there was no path for them to engage with these kinds of programs, even if they chose to, because often these things are priced for a very different kind of audience. And so she decided to maintain the program and fund it. Essentially, New York Theatre Ballet funded it itself. And she changed the program. She made it a year-round program where the children would be essentially auditioned in the shelters. And auditioned is sort of a word that we use loosely. Typically, you audition and you look for the dancer, the young person who has the best technical aptitude for dance. But in this case, actually, what Diana was looking for was a child who was most eager to be part of this. Whether they became a dancer or not kind of wasn't the point. She chose a handful of children, and she integrated them into the ballet academy. They took classes with all of the other students in the normal ballet academy. And um, importantly, she kept them anonymous, uh, which required making sure that they had their transportation taken care of, and they had their leotards and their tights, and then as they got older, maybe their point shoes. She added, over the years, uh, winter jackets and backpacks and school supplies and mentoring and role modeling and tutoring and translation services. And did you feel like you fit in with the other kids in the program because you're in with kids of all income levels, the way you described it? Really different backgrounds from you. Right. Uh, no, is the short answer. I did not fit in with any of the other children, but also it didn't matter because I'm not sure that any of the other children fit in with each other. You, know, you walk into the ballet studio, everyone's wearing the same uniform. You know, you can't tell the difference. And everyone is working hard to not fall over. You know, you sort of, you ignore the world for an hour and a half. And um, you make a little team, you know, as you're trying to figure out a particularly difficult step or a rhythm or trying to do an impossible physical feat. Um, and you root for each other when they succeed. And, or maybe you get a little jealous if somebody else gets it and you don't. But sort of nothing else matters. You just disappear into the, the music, into the movement. So it's kind of a refuge, maybe, from the rest of the stress of your life? Absolutely. That is exactly the right word. The LIFT program made even more significant investments to keep Stephen in ballet. For myself and a couple of others, it became necessary even to help with the academic education of the students. Uh, so my private schooling in New York City from sixth grade onward was paid for entirely through LIFT scholarships. I was a little surprised to learn that LIFT paid for Stephen's private school tuition, but it makes sense because Stephen joined the New York Theater Ballet Company when he was 14 years old, right around the year 2000. In public school, you can't get excused because you have eight shows a week <laughs> so easily. So that was part of it. The other part of it was, for some students, um, it's clear that their interests lie in academic rigor and study. And even if they weren't going to become dancers, helping these children achieve their greatest potential is sort of the ethos of what LIFT is about. Um, and, and that's really important. There are a lot of other programs that are arts programs uh, for children whose aim is to create new artists. And if you're not interested as a child to become a dancer or a singer or a musician or whatever, then no matter how great the program is, it's not for you. But LIFT is not like that. Uh, LIFT is really designed to help each child achieve what is best for them. And so for some, that means success is being the first in their family to graduate from college. For others, it means success is becoming a professional dancer. And for others yet, it means success is being the one who doesn't go to prison in their family. Myra Romero acknowledged all that Stephen had gained from his ballet experience, but that didn't mean that she wanted him to make a career out of dance. And as a single mother... Her opinion carried a lot of weight. My mother was, you know, mother and father and Jesus and all the things all at once. And I had spent, since I was seven years old, 
spending most of my time creating a new family with the ballet company and with the ballet school and with the ballet world. Uh, my mother and I, when I was a teenager, got into some pretty big arguments about what she called my plan B. She was supportive of me being a dancer, only to the extent that she understood what it meant to be a dancer, which is to say not very much at all. Um, it wasn't because she didn't appreciate dance or she didn't like dance or she wasn't artistic. Uh, it was because she didn't see a mature fiscal future in it. Um, she was worried about me growing up and having a career and being happy and being successful. In order to prove her wrong in the best act of teenage rebellion, I think, that has ever been attempted, I took a job as a dancer in Argentina I didn't tell her about it until seven days before I got on the plane. And you were how old? And I was 17 years old. So I, I moved away, I moved to South America, and I was there for a year before I got homesick. I didn't tell her that, though. I came home after that contract was done, and I was dancing again in New York, and I had this sort of wanderlust. I needed to get back out. I had seen so much. You know, the company in Argentina was a touring company, and in the year that I was down there, uh, we'd been around the world literally three times, and it was really incredible. The way dancers are perceived in the world outside of the United States is like night and day. It opened my eyes to the possibility of what dance could be. Dancers internationally are more like a pop star or a rock star. It's, it's sort of a cultural distinction. In the United States, it's really common for me to tell someone that I'm a dancer and for them to ask me what my job is. And abroad, it's exactly the opposite of that. After I'd come back from Buenos Aires, I then moved to Europe, and I was living in Estonia for three years working in the company there. And, you know, I'd go to the bar after a show, and, you know, I'd have dinner, I'd have a drink, and if the barman found out that I was a dancer and I just had a show, drinks were on him. And in one instance, he actually announced to the bar that they had a ballerina in the room and everyone wanted to come over and shake my hand, you know? That's a particularly extreme case. You know, Estonia is about as close to Russia as you can get without being in Russia. And classical ballet in that part of the world is really a fundamental part of the culture. The worlds that the dancers travel in are kind of in this elite space in the U.S. just because dance is kind of considered this elite thing. Um, whereas internationally, it's more common that dancers are of the people, you know, the way a football star might be or something. So my relationship with my mother, it was me running away to prove points as a young person. And her, um, incidentally, she had a fear of flying. And so she didn't actually see me perform very often. I had the bulk of my career, the, some of the best stuff I've ever done on the biggest stages with the best roles, with the most incredible partners, with the most famous choreographers were all done internationally. And um, she didn't get to see any of that. You know, this was before the internet, if I, if I remember correctly. I mean, it was, yeah, I'd have to call Collect Long Distance International to talk with her. Um, every now and again, I'd try to mail her a VHS so that she could watch the show. When he was 22 years old, Stephen's mother, Myra Romero, was diagnosed with cancer. And Stephen asked, Mom, should I come home? And she said, well, you're not a doctor. What are you going to do? You should stay and do what you're doing. Um, and so I stayed in Europe, and a couple months later, she called again, and she said, no, okay, it's time to come home now. And I came home, and only a couple months after that, she'd, she'd died. But it was so interesting, because at the funeral, all of her friends came, and I didn't know any of her friends. I had been away at this point for, I don't know, six years, and I really didn't know anything about her life here while I was away. And at the funeral, her friends would come up and... To the last one of them, they'd come up and they'd say, you know, so sorry for your loss or some version of that. And then they'd go, you must be Stephen the dancer. And it was so special to know that even though she and I fought about it a lot, that she knew me as a dancer, even without her ever often actually seeing me on the stage. Long years overseas, dancing with the greatest artists in the world, a radically different, adventurous life left Stephen little time to dwell on that shocking eviction from his childhood home or the three years that he'd lived in a homeless shelter. Right around the time of his mother's death, someone approached him about a project that would bring all of that past right back into painful focus. I'm Tenery Taylor. You're listening to Constant Wonder.
In 2011, filmmaker David Peterson got a tip about a ballet star who had started dancing as a child in a homeless shelter. By this time, Stephen Melendez was a principal dancer with the New York Theater Ballet. So David met Stephen and began filming him and trying to figure out what drove him. Here are his first impressions of the dancer. And I was so wowed and captivated so I said, wow, this guy is a really fine dancer. His background actually had nothing to do with his dancing except maybe giving him power and emotional strengths. I was sort of in the meat part of my dance career, which, as you know, is a short career for most. And, you know, David, we haven't really talked about this, but right around that time was when my mother passed away as well. And so all of this lined up in an interesting way to have these conversations about my background and where I'd come from, recognizing that I had suddenly lost all connection to that. You know, I, I never knew my father and my family is sort of extended, you know, I'm, I'm not close to them at all. So it was interesting to be tackling the loss of my mother concurrent with a sort of examination of my childhood for the next 11 years, David Peterson would show up, camera in tow, at Stephen's rehearsals, performances, workshops. He even filmed the dancer standing on the street corner contemplating his childhood home. The probing questions digging up his childhood were not always welcomed by Stephen, and we'll hear more on that in a moment. But first, let's learn about some of the kids participating in the LIFT program today kids who are living in shelters, as Stephen once had done, or in other housing-insecure situations. These many years later, as a professional dancer, Stephen had become involved teaching workshops in the very same shelter where he once lived. So we did this whole workshop with Stephen and the kids, and they're in the courtyard of the shelter. Then there is this wonderful thing after the parents came up and the kids were sort of eager, is that I went outside in front of the shelter and these kids were practicing the steps that they had learned. So first position, second position, fifth position, you know, and they worked with their arms. And Yolansi, who was one of the students featured there, she's showing to the other kids how to do it. And, and it was the most beautiful thing. I knew that that was the essence of the film, that here are these kids who live on the street and they're using the street as their stage. And that to me was absolutely glorious because it told me that this is the essence of what Stephen and Diana have been doing and trying to do for these children is to take this art form, this aristocratic art form really, and let the children interpret it, you know, give it up to them. And then I said, that's it. That's the film. That is where my heart is. The children on that street captured David Peterson's heart. But the filmmaker proposed to continue to follow one rising star named Victor right up through his teenage years. That bumps right up against some of the same privacy issues that had made Stephen himself uncomfortable with the press his career had received. Might publicity like this, revealing a background in poverty, put at risk a career in professional ballet? Stephen was actively dancing with the New York Theater Ballet when he became the director of their outreach arm, that is, Lyft. His vantage point gave him an insightful perspective on Victor, a young man who has had a similar career arc to Stephen's and similar feelings about sharing his past. I couldn't see the end from the beginning with Victor. And, and I'd hate to put words in his mouth, but my impression has been that he was a lot like me in his relationship to his background, to his past, that he was also very much trying to be viewed and judged for his dancing equally with other dancers that he saw in the world. As we got further along the process of filming and as his career started to look more concrete, um, when it was a little bit less of a question whether he'd become a professional dancer or not, and more of a certainty, 
I think suddenly he opened up a little bit more. Here is a clip from the documentary Lift where Victor Abreu is telling Diana Beyer about his acceptance into a prestigious ballet company where he would be dancing with some of the best dancers in the world. The executive director said, we want you to start in January. So I got in for New York City Ballet. Oh my gosh, that is fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am so proud of you. Thank I can't you. tell you. But his success had never been guaranteed, even though he was extremely talented. Sometimes growing up, Victor was standing in his own way. Every young person finds the moment when they test the limits of the permissions that have been given to them. You know, they stay out past curfew, or they start to be a little bit disrespectful, or they test the limits of what's allowed. Victor had the double opportunity of testing those limits in his personal life at home and in what was becoming a professional environment, even as a young child. I mean, dancers, I, I was a full member of the company when I was 14 years old. Um, Victor, similarly, was having professional gigs already when he was a young teenager. So I think that the challenges that he was creating for himself, which is really the best way to put it, were the same challenges that any young person would put in front of themselves at that age. The differences, the important differences, that the need for success for someone like Victor and someone like me is much, much, much higher. We get much fewer chances at bat. Um, you know, in a very similar example, uh, you get the stereotype in America of a white person getting pulled over by the police and a black person getting pulled over by the police. You know, you put them both in the same position a hundred times and you're going to see a statistical difference in the outcome, right? And so here we have Victor at a young age and myself at a young age as well being given really incredible opportunities. And for people like us, those really incredible opportunities may not come around again. Uh, whereas for somebody else, maybe it's okay if they miss the ball and they, you know, they'll get another shot at it in a couple of years. Well, and I, I just want to clarify because when you talk about young people making problems for themselves, from what I saw in the film, I mean, we're not talking about like experimenting with drugs. We're talking about being late to a rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about, exactly, we're talking about being late for a rehearsal. You know, the dance world is pretty strict. Um, you show up late to a rehearsal and um, a director is very likely to never use you again, ever, full stop, one rehearsal. There are thousands of young people that are aspiring to become dancers. Uh, getting into New York City Ballet is more difficult than getting into Harvard College. There are more people auditioning trying to get into that company, and there are fewer spots available every year than there are. I mean, and I say Harvard College because I think people understand that as sort of a social idea of how complicated it is. So when Victor was given the opportunity to go to School of American Ballet, as was I, you know, the stakes involved in screwing that up are really high. So much competition to achieve at that level. He was going through that moment, uh, that opportunity at the same time that he was going through the very typical youth development life stage of questioning authority and all of those things. Now, Victor, like I, he, he comes from a home that is very loving, but unconventional. If we consider a conventional home to be a happily married mother and father, or mother and mother, or father and father, two, two adults, and, you know, a sibling and a dog, maybe, and a white picket fence. He and I come from places very, 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 very far from that. And it's not for lack of care and love, which I, I know that he had in his family, but there is maybe a different kind of role modeling available for us. Stephen Melendez would argue that no place is better suited to teach discipline than the Ballet Academy, with its demand for hard work and focus. Childhood spent in the ballet studio teaches self-discipline and work ethic and confidence and teamwork and individual responsibility. And those skills are going to be transferable, whether that child becomes a line cook at McDonald's or a heart surgeon or a dancer, right? And there's something about putting five children in a room, teaching them how to spin around on one foot, and then seeing what happens the next day. You know, the next day, four of them are going to spin around on one foot and the, and the fifth one is going to fall over. And they're not going to have fallen over because 
they didn't have a wealthy family or because they were white and the other students were black or because, I mean, pick your thing, right? There's no excuse. You do the work, you do the work. And the sooner a child learns that, that they actually do have control over their own success or failure, the sooner they have the opportunity to earn their own self-respect. And that is a really critical milestone in the development of any child. I think that uh, it's important to recognize that so many kids and so many families uh, who are dealing with homelessness or home insecurity, they're one crisis away from being on the street. One of the kids said, everyone's equal on the dance floor. And Stephen sort of in an interview said, yeah, everyone's equal on the dance floor if you work hard enough. And I think that coming from that background is actually can be a source of strength. As Stephen says in the film about Victor, I hope he uses his background as a secret weapon. I looked at a lot of footage of Stephen dancing from age 14, 13 on up, fully through his professional career in Europe. And I just recognized the power that is in the body and comes somehow from the urgency of that background. Would you agree with that, Stephen? Are dancers like, say, you, say, like Victor, who are very successful, are you channeling something from your own history there? Any dancer will be an incredible asset in any field that they choose to move into when they are done with their dance career. Um, the kind of discipline and work ethic and the kind of at-all-costs mentality that a dancer trains for to be on the stage and to achieve is unparalleled. I don't think there is another field in which a person can learn that kind of habit. And for a dancer with a background like I have or that Victor has, we've already proven to ourselves that we can overcome, that we can achieve. And everything else after that is inconsequential. Yeah, I can do that. I moved out of a homeless shelter, I can do that. And I think you combine these two things and you get somebody like Victor with his background, with his drive and his already proven capacity for overcoming, for achieving. There's really nothing that can stop him. The only thing that will get in his way is him himself. Um, but there's certainly nobody else is going to get in his way if he's achieved as much as he has already. There's nothing to stop him. For all we've heard about becoming unstoppable, can ghosts from the past really be exercised? Stephen himself felt haunted by his past, even as he was coaching and encouraging and inspiring young dancers in the program. In the documentary Lift, there's a surprising scene where Stephen has just finished giving a workshop at the shelter where he once lived. Here's David Peterson. The only shelter that we were able to get into for five years of trying, because shelters are very difficult to get into, like maximum security prisons, because they always get bad press, was the shelter that Stephen grew up in. And we got that because essentially the person who ran the shelter remembered Stephen and loved him because he thought he was a rock star as a dancer. So we got in, and I knew that it was going to be a dramatic, emotional experience because he hadn't been there for years. So there was the one scene I didn't film myself, so I hired a guy who I knew was a pro, and I knew that he would capture whatever happened. And Stephen said, oh, let's just check out, see what's going on with where I lived. And so rambling along, and Stephen goes into another building. The cameraman is tilting up, and we're waiting. He said, where's Stephen? And so we go back in, and we discover he's on the floor and he's fainted. And of course, I'm totally shocked. Thank God I'm not filming. The cameraman is capturing it. I'm completely aghast, you know. I've never seen Steven like this. He's sweating, he's nearly crying, and he's dumbfounded. I tell him to put his hands between his knees, and then he revives, and he just says, I gotta get out of here. 
And so he goes outside. Now, a scene that's not in the film is when I go out and talk to him. And I said, what happened? I said, there's a smell in there. And I said, a what? A smell. And I said, that you remember? And he said, yeah. He didn't really want to deal with that. But I knew that was the beginning of the film because it becomes his journey to go back to that trauma by living essentially his childhood through these children. What do you remember of this episode? Hmm. I don't remember very much. Um, yeah, I hadn't been there in a long time, been back to that place. And I was not particularly interested to go back, um, not in the way that David had asked, you know. And it was really difficult. It's an interesting thing. The course of making this this film has asked me to examine my childhood more than I think any person should ever examine their childhood, you know, 11 years of being interviewed and being followed and being prodded at these questions. David maybe should have a degree in psychology at this point or something. Yeah, psychoanalysis <laughs> through documentary. That, that, that was a particularly difficult day. And I don't know where it came from. The smell definitely was something that was like a sense memory maybe one that I don't think I've smelled any place else. It was a combination of cleaning fluids and, I don't know, government sterile funk. I don't know what to call it. And, you know, at that point, I don't know that I really understood what it meant for me to be the director of the Lyft program doing this project. I mean, I understood what it meant for the parents and the students. I understood the power of me going in as someone who looks like the people in these places um, and being able to connect with them by saying, you know, I came through this so you can do it too. I understood that. And I had been teaching for a long time, and so I understood how to relate to children by making sure that they understand that you are on their team, that you're on their side, which is easier to do if they think you understand their perspective. But up until that moment, I don't know that I understood what all of this was doing for me. You know, I, I saw myself as a professional dancer. I was a performer. It was almost like this work with the children was a secondary thing. Then suddenly I realized that actually this work was the thing. And the work as a performer was in service of this somehow. As a dancer, how open were you about your past? Uh, not at all. I, and I spent most of my uh, early career running away from what I, what I call the hyphen. I really hated that I was known as the homeless dancer or the outreach dancer or the dancer who in parentheses, was discovered as, at a young age in a New York City shelter, close parentheses, you know. It was really difficult for me because I wanted to be judged on what I was doing, you know. Was I a good dancer or not? And I'm okay if it was no, if it was not, but I didn't feel like my background should have anything to do with it. Did making the film then change, or at least having David following you everywhere and asking you questions, did that change how you wanted to talk about, or even did it make you more willing to talk about your past? Yes, but here's an interesting thing. You know, the film took so long to make. Now, looking back, I realize that it was what I needed to do to arrive where I am now, to have the mission in life that I have now, to make dance accessible for everyone and to be an advocate for the homeless and to do all of these things about arts education and youth development and all of these things that drive me. I don't know that if I hadn't gone through the process of making the film to arrive here, that I would have arrived here. But also, the film itself is the evidence of why all of those things are important. So it all was happening at the same time. And one thing was feeding the other. You know, the, making the film was feeding the growth of my personal mission. And my personal mission then therefore fed what the film would become. And so the film ends up being this testament to the importance of arts education for everyone and dance as a tool for expression and the resilience of children and breaking stereotypes of the homeless population in America. And all of that was happening concurrent to me wanting to make all of that true. Stephen Melendez threw himself into this new primary mission of his helping ballet students succeed in life, particularly when the stakes are high, as high as life and death, which they are for some of these kids from the streets. I'm Tenery Taylor, and this is Constant Wonder. Mm. 
LIFT, the outreach program of the New York Theater Ballet, isn't a talent search, not primarily. Its purpose is to use the discipline of the dance studio to transform lives. Remember when David talked about those young girls practicing ballet on the street? He referred to a girl named Yolansi. She was demonstrating the different ballet positions, first, second, etc. Several years after taping that scene, David captured a conversation Stephen had with the girl, who at this point was 14 and had been suspended from school. Yolansi was in a really bad place. She was getting into the kind of trouble in school that really could derail her, her whole life. You know, she was getting into fights at school and she was really hanging around with the wrong kids and really making trouble, you know, the kind where the police would certainly soon be getting involved. And I explained to her in a way that I think her parents could have, and I'm sure they did, but, you know, when your parents tell you something, it's different. You know, I was able to come from the outside and tell her, look, (laughs) you're really screwing up your life here. And if you keep down this path, you're going you're gonna to really be in trouble. And the truth is that you have a lot of people around you that are trying to tell you this, and you're not listening. Um, and I think she heard me. And it's fortuitous that David was there with his camera, and he, and he caught that moment, that scene. And I think it's one of the most powerful scenes in the film because it highlights how real all of this is. Do you think it's likely that had you not made the film you would still be trying to get people to ignore your past? Yeah, probably. I I was on track in my mind to be a dancer and then to be a choreographer. I tried as often as I could not to have my past influence my dancing. Now, I'll be honest, let's talk about that for a minute, because part of the reason why I didn't want my uh, dancing to be influenced by my past was because I've never seen a piece of classical choreography that has anything to do with homelessness. So... There was no place for my past to be involved in my classical ballet career. So that's an interesting conversation to have about the exclusionary qualities of classical dance and how the dance industry needs to change the voices that it puts on the stage and the kinds of stories we tell. Are you able to do that at New York Theatre Ballet? Absolutely. That's exactly what my job is. I commission new works and I, I choose which choreographers work at, with our company and which don't, and I choose which dancers work for our company and which don't. And so it's absolutely my responsibility to ensure that we have a diversity of voices on the stage and behind the scenes, and for me, very importantly, in the audiences, to make sure that everyone has a seat at this uh, sort of town square, we can call it, right? Everyone should be heard, you know? Back to the question, though, um, No, I I don't think that I would be doing what I'm doing now if not for the process of making the film. The vision of what Stephen is trying to accomplish, both in his role as artistic director and in allowing his story to be told as part of this movie, is captured in a gala performance that the Lyft students participated in. In choreographing one particular dance, Stephen wanted to express the beauty of everyday movement. In the performance, this number would open with dancers of all ages and abilities representing life's journeys by walking ever so slowly across the stage. During one rehearsal, Stephen asked the parents to stand in for the dancers and perform this measured walk. And the parents... At first, as you can see in the film, just what? You have to dance? And he says, no, 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 listen, look, look. We're moving from one side to the other. And it's the same extraordinary moment that I had when I watched the children on the street in that sidewalk in front of the shelter. It's that the parents are so willing to embrace this idea that somehow there is a dance in everydayness, that they are capable, too, of expressing themselves. It just makes me cry every time I see that. In the film, it takes nearly 90 seconds for the participants to slowly walk what looks like a distance of about 20 feet across the stage. And the parents, they concentrate deeply on each roll of the foot from heel to toe, each slight lift of the leg, 
A couple of the dads are dressed in Michael Jordan hats and t-shirts. Yolansi's father, Chino, sports diamond stud earrings, a large tattoo on his forearm, and a red bandana under his Bulls baseball cap. Their aesthetic is a world away from a Moscow performance of Swan Lake at the Bolshoi Theater. Chino, if you saw him on a street corner, you might stop for a moment and say, should I get, you know, too close? You know, he's got a tough looking exterior, but that man is the most tender hearted, loving father and really was working so carefully on measuring his steps in that studio. Everyone's wearing these big, heavy Jordan tennis shoes and they're moving with such grace and delicacy and beauty. What they were watching on the stage was something that they had seen before, that they weren't watching a fantasy. They weren't watching swans turning into princesses or a nutcracker doll marrying a Spanish person with an Arabian dance. They were actually watching the people that they see out on the street, whether they knew it or not. And for the particular audience that was in attendance for the final performance, it was especially meaningful because they were watching themselves. They essentially took and built their own interpretation of a classical art form and made it their own. David Peterson hadn't always been so sure that this simple dance sequence could be so meaningful. And that came out when I asked him, as we often ask our guests on this show, what he thinks about the concept of constant wonder. He reflected back on the conversation when Stephen first told him about this walking sequence. When I paid attention, I felt this constant wonder. So an example would be, in fact, even this final dance. Uh, Stephen had this idea that was much more dramatic and the kids were pounding around this phoenix of Victor coming up and rising up through this pounding thing. And I said, oh, that's great. And then Stephen came back to me a week later and said, ah, I got a better idea. They're just going to walk slow motion across the stage for 12 minutes. And I said, oh, uh, how are we going to make that dramatic, right? There was constant wonder in the nuance in Stephen's rehearsals, but I still didn't know what it was going to come off like as a final performance up until the dress rehearsals the day before. And that was the moment, only the moment, where I really allowed that wonder to sort of seep in. And I said, oh my God, this is so moving because it's so earned. Every gesture was so earned from that whole 11 year period that took us to that point. I said, yes, I feel the wonder of these children and their promise. Stephen, too, had thoughts about the promise of young children, spurred on when the film won the Shine Global Children's Resilience in Film Award on the festival circuit. Since then, I've been really interested in this word resilience because the film really highlights the resilience that these children have and that I think is inherent in all of us. Every now and again, it's nice to stop and look back and to look around and to recognize the varied ways that all of us are demonstrating resilience every day. Stephen singled out the youngest child profiled in the film, a girl named Shariah, as an example of resilience and of wonder. The moment that really gets me every time I see the film, we ask her to demonstrate a movement that is uh, indicative of the way she's feeling in her life. In this next clip from the film, you'll get to hear the voice of Yolansi, who, as a teenager, is helping Stephen choreograph that dance that David just referred to. And they're at the shelter. They're asking kids to come up with everyday moves that they'll incorporate into the dance. Here's Yolansi talking to young Shariah. We're doing, like, this choreography about our backgrounds because I've started here from ballet. Yeah, and exactly, we all have... So we're like getting movements from the people who came from here into the work. Do you have a move? I think I have one. I'll say this one. Yeah, that's good. What do you think that means? Strong. Okay, I like that. 
And she does this really great thing where she raises her fists into the air and she starts marching back and forth. You know, we ask her, um, well, what does that mean, that movement? And it's such an interesting moment against the backdrop. She's quite literally at that moment standing surrounded by barbed wire fences in this homeless shelter. And when prompted, sort of without even thinking about it, her character is such that she feels strong. And later in the film, and here she is, you know, a young girl, she's maybe eight or nine, and she's explaining that in order to be approved to move out of the shelter, the inspections require them to keep their space and their belongings neat and tidy in the shelter itself. It's not an easy thing to do. And whenever they fail an inspection, they're set back some amount of time, and then they don't get approved for their new home. And she's just a little girl who has this unfortunately deep understanding of the bureaucratic process of the shelter system and public housing and Section 8 and all of these kinds of subsidy programs. You know, it's a kind of knowledge that no eight-year-old should have. And she understands that the result of not doing it right, of failing all this bureaucracy stuff, is that she may not get a home. And on the exact other side of that, she's the one saying that she feels encouraged and she feels strong, and she keeps this positive outlook somehow in the way that actually does fit very well with the stereotype of an eight-year-old, you know, that sort of naive, rosy unicorn outlook on the world. And so it's such an interesting juxtaposition for me to understand that she understands the world the way it is, and that she still lives in a world the way she wants it to be. And for me, that's resilience. And for me, that is constant wonder. Stephen Melendez, the artistic director of the New York Theater Ballet and the subject of the new documentary, Lift. We also spoke with the director of that film, David Peterson. Lift is available on multiple streaming platforms and has been out in theaters in major metropolitan areas. This episode was produced by me, Tenery Taylor, with help from Marcus Smith and Mamie Teeples. Sound designed by James Call and Carly Wilson. If you like what you're hearing on Constant Wonder, please give us a five-star rating on your podcast platform or share a review. It helps so much to get the word out. I'm Tenery Taylor. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.